Well, good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the Rancho Mirage City Council, Library and Observatory Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. This is a regular meeting, and this is Thursday, September 19th at 1 o'clock. So we'll start off by uh, a flag salute, and if we can have uh, Steve Quintanilla, our city attorney, lead us. That would be good. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Steve, and everyone. And now we'll go on to uh, roll call. And today, Johnny Almi is going to be doing it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Kite? Here. Councilmember Townsend? Here. Councilmember Weil? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. And Mayor Smotridge? Here. OK. So we start off with some presentations. And uh, first of all, we're going to have an update on automated external defibrillator and the it's otherwise known as an AED and the installation that was took place at the Rancho Mirage High School. And I want to thank you so much, Chris. This is Chris Caldwell and he is the assistant principal and athletic director for Rancho Mirage High School. Welcome. Well, great. Thank you very much for, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for having me here this afternoon. I'm here on behalf of Rancho Mirage High School to thank uh, the city council and the city of Rancho Mirage for very generously um, supplying the money to buy some more AEDs than we uh, had at our school installed earlier this year. Um, in, if you could start the presentation, in um, July 1st of this year, a new law went into effect in the state of California requiring all high schools to have AEDs on their campuses. Um, it also included a part where high schools also have to have emergency action plans for how to use those AEDs and how to implement them at all the different sites. We're currently working on that. Um, again, what you were able to do helps us, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that um, in just a minute. But I want to show you first a quick video uh, that I saw a year or two ago, which really highlights the value of AEDs at a high school campus, which may, you may not think may think that AEDs um, are most needed in certain uh, sectors of the community. And, and this will show you exactly what we're talking about in, in terms of a high school campus. So if you could run the video, please. Oops, we'll try again. <clears throat> Take two. <laughs> you can sing anytime. Just I can't. Out. Unfortunately, I absolutely could not, <laughs> and I would, you would uh, never grant any request that I made. That's an A and Tom. It is really hard for Claire and her parents to watch this video, but they're sharing it publicly to show people how important it is to get trained in CPR and to know how to use an AED. Claire had experienced shoulder pain for a couple of years, but her doctors never suspected her heart, and no one expected this. I was like right about here, and then I staggered a couple steps. 17 year old Claire Crawford is the girl in the video, the one whose heart suddenly stops. Well, I feel nauseous watching it because it's a little scary. It happened here in the gym at Loganville Christian Academy during an October volleyball match. It was senior night. Claire's parents, Eric and Lisa, had set up a video camera across the gym. It was up a up on the stage. You don't expect that it's going to happen at your school, right, literally right in front of you. I had just served, and then I'd set, set the ball up, and then moved back, and then I just remember feeling like I was about to pass out. Claire grabs her chest, then hits the floor in full cardiac arrest. Terrified. Terrified. The camera's still rolling. Claire is surrounded. You're very nervous. 
you're not sure what to do, you're not sure what you're seeing. Julie Sermons, a school administrator and member of Loganville Christian Academy's Code Blue team, trained in CPR by Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, sprang into action, helped by an athletic trainer and a parent who also knows CPR. Claire had lost all signs of life. She wasn't breathing. We couldn't find a pulse. She did not look like there was any life to her. And I, at that point, didn't know what to do. But Julie Sermons did, because the Code Blue team had practiced this same drill at least 15 times in the last six years. And instinct and training kicked in. You do the one thing that you know to do, and then you do the next thing, and then you do the next thing. Have someone call 911. Go grab the AED. That AED was only about 30 feet away. Lots of praying. Lots of, I mean, panic and praying. You hear a lot of noise. The machine is constantly telling you what to do. I mean, it, tell, it was telling her to shock, which to Julie and I kind of looked at each other, and she, then she pushed it. And just like that, four and a half minutes after they lost Claire, they get her back. I woke up to one of the ladies in my face that had been giving me mouth to mouth, and the AED machine was like shouting CPR, CPR, and the alarm was going off. Claire's heart, which tests later revealed had three severe blockages, had slipped into a fatal irregular rhythm known as ventricular fibrillation or VFib. And it's a rhythm that can only be corrected by a shock, so if I like gone down and they hadn't had the AED, CPR would not have been enough to bring me back. I would have had to wait for the ambulance. Walton County EMS got there quickly in about 11 minutes. By that time, Claire was already sitting up and talking. She underwent a triple bypass, then surgery to put in an internal defibrillator. I was just blessed to be in a place where they, they could be treated. So like two weeks before that, I was in Honduras on a mountain and there's no way I w if it had happened then. I would have lived, so. And this week, Children's Health Care of Atlanta shared the video of Claire's AED save on its Facebook page. In the first two days, it's been viewed seven million times. Mm. One of the comments that sticks out are, why would any school not have one of these? And Loganville Christian has three stationary AEDs and two travel ones that go with their sports teams. They were all paid for with grants. Children's Healthcare of Atlanta's Project Save trains schools in how to respond to emergencies just like this one. And on Friday, Project Save is holding a drill day. They're asking schools to practice their emergency action plans so that they know what to do just in case. Because Tom and Sid Okay, and... Uh Thanks to you, Rancho Mirage High School now has 11 AEDs on our campus. Um, for those of you who've been to the campus, it's a very big campus. Uh, it takes a long time to get from one spot to another. But uh, with your help, we were able to do some things that we frankly couldn't do before. And uh, I, I've seen that video 50 times, and it's still emotional for me to watch that video. I'm a parent of a parent of high school athletes. I'm an athletic director, and all you see when you watch that video, if you're an athletic director, is this could be my gym, that could be a kid on one of my teams, and that happened right in front of me. Her dad was filming that. It was senior night, and her dad was doing the filming. So the video is actually from her father who watched it happen. So um, not to, you know, it turned out very well because they did have AEDs and because the people that they had there were very well trained. And so we are trying to do that as well at Rancho Mirage High School. Um, the slide that you see now in front of you is, um, again, the state law went into effect July 1st. So we had two stationary AEDs positioned on our campus and one that travels with our athletic trainer. Okay, so she takes it wherever she goes on campus and off. Um, so those are the three locations that we chose. The one right in the middle of the 500 building is where the trainer's office is. So that one actually moves. The others are in the foyer of the gym building, the 500 building, and in the foyer of the main office. But as you can see looking at this, um, there's quite a bit of the buildings that are not covered. Both the 300 and the 600 building are two-story buildings. Um, so to be able to get to, there's something called the three-minute rule, which means that you have to be able to get to an AED and get it back to whoever needs it within three minutes. And without your help, we would not have been able to do that. So now, because of what you have done uh, for us, our school now looks like this. And they should start, there you go, they're starting to populate. So we have one in every single one of our buildings. We have two actually permanently stationed in the 500 building, which is our gym building, because we actually have two gyms. So one is stationed in the foyer of the auxiliary gym, one in the main gym. 
We do have two down at the stadium, the building that you see up on the top. Um, up on the top, we have one where you buy tickets, those of you who are familiar. Uh, Mr. Kite, who comes to quite a few of our games, will know that you come in on a, a higher level. We have an AED up there, and then we also have one down by the snack bar in the stadium. So again, um, what we're able to do, here's another picture of exactly where all the AEDs are um, throughout campus, and you can see that, that the campus is very, very well covered. So on behalf of Rancho Mirage High School and everybody involved, this is one of those things that you hope you never have to use. But we do know that if we did have to use it, one would be readily available and, and be easily accessible. So thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? Yes, I do. How yes. many people are proficient in running this that are on the campus every day? Okay, AEDs are designed to be run by anybody. Um, they require absolutely no training. They will, they will actually talk you through exactly what to do. They will be able to sense... If they tell you to put the pads on the patient, they will be able to sense whether a shock is needed, and then they will tell you that they are going to shock or not. Um, all of our coaches, all of our staff are CPR trained, and part of CPR training includes some AED training now. But again, the design of AEDs is so that anybody could use them at any time. Do you bring this um, education to the classrooms, to the students? Formal, not in, not in terms of any kind of training. Again, they're designed to be used, but, but the students do know where they are. It's part of our emergency action plan for the school. So we have postings all around that tell the students and the teachers and the staff exactly where all of these are. Plus, we're doing trainings with all of our teams. So a tennis team out on the tennis court may have a different response than a football team down at the football field or a basketball team in the gym. So we practice these scenarios as they said they did. Yeah. If you can see, you know, when that, when that girl went down, they went immediately into action. So somebody told somebody to call 911. The, if you saw, the girls all went out of the gym because they were going out onto the street to wave down the EMS to get them into the gym. So they've all been trained on that. We're working on our plans for all the different places and practicing those as we speak. So uh, we are very excited about this. Again, I hope it's something we never have to use, but um, we feel very confident that, that we'll be able to get help if we need to. Well, it sounds like you have it well covered. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Chris, here? it's great to have you here today. How about saying a few words about the Rattlers? Uh, we're right in the middle of our uh, fall season right now. We're actually wrapping up the um, preseason and getting into our league season. Football team's doing very well. They're three and one right now. Uh, our volleyball team just won their first Desert Empire League game ever uh, last night, beat uh, Shadow Hills in our gym, so that was exciting. Our boys water polo team is actually undefeated right now. They won a tournament. They're nine and zero currently, and uh, I think actually 11 and zero now, and looking to go to another tournament next week and start league play uh, very shortly as well. So things are going well. You know, if you feel free to come by anytime, give me a call. And we've always got something going on, uh, both at, on campus and off. So please come by and check it out. Good. Good. Go Rattlers. Go Rattlers. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, I just wanted to thank you as well because uh, the city, uh, you alerted the city to this need. So the district was providing you three AEDs. You thought you needed 11 for your campus. Uh, so it's uh, you're a fantastic asset to the community um, of doing your own research, figuring out where you needed them, and then uh, coming to the city to ask for some help with this issue that wasn't getting funded by the district. So thank you for being proactive for the safety of the students on campus. Absolutely. And, and again, you know, on behalf of everything we do, this isn't the first time you've helped us out in, in various things that we've done since in the seven years now that we've been open. I can't believe it's been seven it is, years. It is. Um, but in the seven years we've been open, uh, you guys have been very generous. And this one, however, I think is special because this has to do with the safety of our kids. Um, again, most people don't think that a girl that looks like that, that young, her heart will stop right in the middle of a game. And uh, were it not for the AED, she may not have survived. And so the AEDs are really the key to the whole thing. And, and we feel much better now with the coverage that we have. So thank you. Thank you. And we feel much better also that not, not only did you come to us for some help, but that we could provide it. And when you mention safety, this is talking about saving lives. 
and how you saved that lovely young lady's life. And we are so proud that uh, we can contribute to uh, whatever is needed, when it's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we will move on to our next presentation, and that is from our lovely Sunny Lands. And I don't know who else coming up, but here we have um, Janice Lyle, who's the director of Sunny Lands, and she's got a few more very important people with her. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm very pleased to be able to invite you again to visit Sunny Lands Center and Gardens at the beginning of our ninth season. So it's a surprising to us, too, that we have um, been in operation now for nine years. This year's exhibition, and you all know that we change exhibitions every year, is called Reach for the Sky, um, Tradition and Inspiration. And if we could start the um, <clears throat> program. So as all of our exhibitions, there is an Annenberg connection. In 1976, Walter and Leonore Annenberg commissioned a 30-foot tall red cedar totem pole for Sunnylands. Native uh, First Nations artist um, Henry Hunt carved that quagadal masterpiece, um, which stands on the fifth fairway at the dog leg um, on our Sunnylands grounds. In 2010, his son, Stan Hunt, and his grandson, Jason Hunt, came to Sunnylands, restored the, the original pole, and then rededicated it in 2012 when we opened to the public. So unknown to the Hunt family, to those three artists, American musician and artist Herb Alpert had visited Stanley Park in Vancouver in the 1980s, and he was inspired by quagadal totem poles that he saw there to create vertical sculpture. So this exhibition is an interesting combination. It brings together the work of those three Hunt family carvers with Herb Alpert's um, paintings and sculpture in, a, in an attempt to explore the ways in which artists inspire each other um, across cultures in time and space. So we hope that you'll come and see this amazing exhibition, um, which is open free of charge, Wednesdays to Sundays, between 8.30 and 4, um, uh, starting, it started on September 11th. So in addition to the new exhibition, um, we have already launched our public programming for the new year, and Micheline Gallagher, who's Director of um, Education and Environmental Programs, will speak to you for a second about our most exciting new public program. Thank you. Um, you can actually just go ahead and start the program <laughs> for this. This is um, the return of the Sunnylands Olive Harvest. Five years ago, we launched it um, after some sustainability conversation of what to do with 660 olive trees that were historic, but not fruiting. Um, so after some research and some work, we were able to get our trees fruiting again and started harvesting them. Um, the first public harvest was sort of a shot in the dark, let's see how this goes, and immediately informed us that we needed a lot of learning. <laughs> so we have taken it back, we took it back inside for the last few years and have been producing olive oil, but doing it internally with our ground staff. Um, and this year, for the first time, it's back open to the public and will hopefully continue to, to be so. Um, we harvested probably close to three tons of olives in two days with the help of the public and our staff. Um, the response we got from the public was phenomenal. Um, they loved the experience, um, access to the estate. We had beautiful weather those two days, so thank you for that. Um, and it was just a really, a really wonderful experience. Um, the olive oil will be available in the stores sometime in November. Um, but this really launched our season off. This was the very first day that we were open to the public. Our staff ran the visitor center as well as this harvest all going on at the same time. Very good. 
<clears throat> I still have my first bottle. You did from the first I year? I will not open it. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Micheline. I know you did incredible work putting this all together, and it's only going to get better year after year. And I was there. I had a very fortunate day that I was uh, given an escorted tour to see all the people sitting and picking olives and getting acquainted. I think there was a lot of new best friends that were made. And uh, I took a couple photos myself. So this is the two gals that were... <laughs> that we're uh, putting it all together, obviously, uh, Janice Lyle and McCaleen. And this is a, a closer up shot of uh, how these uh, olives are shaken from the tree. You know, I, a lot of people kind of think that they uh, were just shaken by themselves, but here is one of the favorite gals of our city uh, sitting on the ground, and that is um, Tiana McAmel, and she's from our marketing department. And this is a uh, Mary Levine, and Mary's has served on our Emergency Preparedness Commission for several years. So it's been a lot of fun, and this is one of the byproducts that comes out after the oil is squeezed out. Doesn't look very good, but apparently it's really fabulous as a skin conditioner. And uh, in the next slide, well, here's Michael, um, Tiana again, but this is a gentleman who was in charge of the byproduct, and uh, he was telling us how fabulous it is for your skin, and it's a real exfoliant, and maybe someday in the future, you'll be able to use that along with the uh, olive oil and have it in your, uh, your gift shop also. I can see it did good for his beard. It was. Yes. <laughs> So this is the area where people had lunch. The food has not been brought out yet, but everything was delicious, I've been told, and uh, people can't wait to go back and do it again next year, myself included. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. It was a, an amazing uh, experience, and we thank you all for all the work you do in, in Rancho Mirage. And, uh, and if people are there and they have an opportunity, there's a great cafe also. So you can sit outside and uh, dine al fresco and uh, enjoy the view. So thank you again, and uh, we'll look forward to more good things. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to a gentleman named Doug Hassett. And uh, Doug is actually the president of the board of the Vector Control Board. Welcome. That's correct. Uh, your city manager, Isaiah Hagerman, and I both sit on that board. and. Uh, we have, uh, we both know more about mosquitoes than we ever really thought we would know. So uh, it's been really interesting. And uh, so uh, Madam Mayor and Council, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm a, a partnership specialist with the United States Census Bureau. So I always like to start off by saying I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, because everybody knows that just doesn't really happen. Uh, but anyway, so uh, to cover the topic that I really want to get to today, uh, the upcoming decennial census, as you know, is one of the hottest and most gripping topics uh, to cover uh, uh, the nation as it is uh, today. So if we could uh, start the presentation, that would be great. So we are, as the Census Bureau says, we're on the road to 2020. And uh, that'll be our decennial census. The last one was in 2010, of course. And what we like to say is that we want to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And just a quick little bit of trivia, 1790 was the first census. It was uh, overseen by Thomas Jefferson. He was very concerned about the southwest portion of the country as we are today. The southwest has some very hard to count areas. And uh, so we're concerned about the southwest portion of the country today, right where we sit. Thomas Jefferson was just the same, except he was referring to Tennessee, not Southern California. So the census uh, is the largest, uh, it serves the nations as a leading provider of quality uh, data about its people and the economy. We uh, collect data uh, not only during the 20 or the decennial census times, but we collect data all year long, every year. I've had the fortune, good fortune, of working as a field representative as well. And so I've worked on various surveys that are conducted throughout the year. Uh, one particular survey runs two weeks out of every month, all year long, year after year. And that's what they call the uh, Labor Participation Survey, and it collects all the data that we require to uh, post that unemployment number that we see in the news all the time. But I've had uh, also the experience of seeing our Coachella Valley from one end to the other and from the richest of the rich to the poorest of the poor. So mm -hmm. it's been a, a great uh, education in seeing 
uh, what the census does and where we go and the great people that we talk to around uh, our communities here in, uh, in the Coachella Valley. So it's in the Constitution from the very beginning. It says we're going to count everyone. And uh, that's in Article 1, Section 2 of our Constitution. And of course, it's all about the apportionment of our representatives uh, that are going to be uh, elected for Congress. And of course, it's all about the distribution of government funds back to our communities. And I know the government funding portion is certainly important to our cities. Uh, those uh, funds all come back through various grants that you apply for, but those funds come back uh, to our cities uh, based on uh, school programs, lunch programs, construction, infrastructure, job creation. So the funding that's going to come back uh, to our cities ultimately based on our count uh, is, is very important to the community, and of course that's one reason I'm here today. So uh, I just mentioned this, the apportionment of our U.S. representatives. Uh, almost $700 billion annually starting in 2020 until 2030, so that's $700 billion annually every year. Uh, that equates to about $2,000 per person. So right here in the city of Rancho Mirage, if you say, I looked at uh, a tract map today that the census has, you've got anywhere from about a 10% undercount to about a 20% undercount, depends on where you are in the city, and I've shared some of that information in your folders. But if you take that 10 or 20% times your population times that $2,000, you can see what that might amount to in a shortfall for federal funding coming back to the city. Now, many of our cities here in the desert, we have the same issue. We've got snowbirds. Yeah. Uh, we certainly have a homeless population. So you've got houses that may be occupied during the census. You may not. Certainly Canadians, if they're here for the winter, they're not going to be counted. They need to be U.S. citizens. For those that are snowbirds, they're here. At the time of the census, they need to make the determination on where is their main residence. Where do they sleep, literally sleep, most of the time? And that's where they should be counted. I see a question for me here. Well, that, I was going to go to that. How do you handle this uh, with getting a true count when uh, a population can go down in the summer like 20 or 30 percent in any of the nine cities that are in Coachella Valley. So are you saying that it's up to that Canadian or that person from Minnesota who lives in Minnesota and comes here for four months to make that decision? It doesn't seem like that's the right way to do it. That, that, is, is, it? that is entirely up to them. Where do oh. they call home? But now the good news is, uh, you know, the census, and we'll get to this slide in a moment, but we're really going to start counting in Alaska in January because the ground in the tundra is so frozen, it actually makes it easier for people to get around. Uh, when the, Once they start the thaw for spring, it's very tough to get out and, and get to people. And even those uh, small bush planes that are on skis, they have a much easier time getting in and out of uh, remote areas. So we'll start in Alaska. Then by March, those of us here in the United States will be starting our count. And we'll get to that in a second, too. But it's, um, it's good, I think, for our communities here in the desert that we are going to start the count in March. So many of our snowbirds will still be here. So they can make a decision at that time. Let's see, I'm here six months and a day. How long am I here? Where do I sleep most of the time? And that's where they really should be counted. Doug, are they addressed to that, where they could say, I'm here six months? in Minnesota six months, and can we count them for those six months in the, in the <laughs> census? No. <laughs> it really is, really is going to be uh, their choice, and it really is and should be, literally, the way it reads is where they sleep, where they reside most of the time. And that, that holds true for the homeless. That's why that word sleep is in there, because even for the homeless, where do they sleep? Yeah. And that's where they're going to be counted, and of course we'll have a a team that'll go out and help count the homeless. Uh, in terms of apportionment uh, of our representatives, if you look at this slide, you can see the last time we did this in 2010, Texas got four additional representatives. Well, this kind of goes back to where do people live? Yeah. But that happened in 2010 for one reason. It was named Katrina. And people left Louisiana really almost on a permanent basis because they had nowhere else to go. Many of them moved to Texas. And so Texas, based on its count, got four more representatives for that 2010 census. 
Uh, our job with the Census Bureau, as we get out and count people, or even today as I'm here before you, we're here to engage, educate, and encourage. And certainly, uh, what I'm here to ask is that we all take our part in making sure that we share how important it is to be counted, and certainly for many reasons, but the one big reason for all of us is that roughly $2,000 per person is our value to our communities, and it's so important that we count as many as we can, not those that are sleeping in Minnesota <laughs> eight months a year. <laughs> I also but, know that the uh, being on the Homeless Committee for a CVAG, that the homeless are very reticent to fill out anything or answer anything to. So that's a problem for they're them. They're very reticent. It's, uh, you know, we all have our degrees of privacy, right? What do we want to share? What do we not want to share? And certainly all across our spectrum of our community, rich or poor, homeless or housed, people have their reasons for being uh, private and not wanting to participate. Our job is to continue that encouragement process and make sure that we can get people and get them counted. And, and, and let people know, I guess I would throw in at this point, um, let me just buzz past this just for a second. I'll, I'll go to this slide really quickly and then I'll get to my point. Uh, but this year, for the very first time, uh, both internet, phone, and a paper form, you'll be able to participate and, and uh, fill out your census form. And so it'll be for those that are uh, tech savvy and want to do it on the internet or via their phone, they can, they can do that or fill out their paper form. I'll get to my, uh, and this is a sample of the form. It is just a sample. The current actual survey is out, but we don't have it in our hands yet. We just understand it's on our way to us. But it's a very simple 10 question survey. Who are you? Where do you live? What, what are your relationships to people in the home? It, it's very simple. There's nothing that's going to be um, invasive in any way, and there's no information that the census is going to share. And this is really the slide I wanted to get to. It's really Title 13 of our U.S. Code. Uh, the Census Bureau and its employees, uh, and I have my colleague Dustin Strouch here with me today just as backup, but we're you know, sworn for life to protect all the personal information that we come across. So we cannot share anything with anybody, nor does the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau, and this is key for everybody to know, we have not, nor we, were we ever going to share information with CBP or ICE or any law enforcement agency. It's just, or any other government agency. It just doesn't happen. And the information that does get out has been boiled down to the statistical data, numbers. It's not individuals. So it's all very safe. It's very sound. The uh, Census Bureau has one of the greatest and, and toughest networks going. We haven't been breached or hacked to this point, and uh, we pray that we uh, never will be. So uh, very safe to participate, and that's a good thing for the homeless to know. And the homeless also fall in this category of identifying hard to count. Um, you know, how are we going to get out and identify all those homeless people? But we have various segments of our society that have always been very private. That makes them hard to count. Uh, so here again, our job, get out, engage, educate, and encourage. Uh, our survey this year will be available in Spanish. Uh, it'll be available uh, in 12 languages total, and it'll be available basically in other, another 59 languages, but it'll be through, through a sort of a glossary or a self, uh, self-defining process or self-interpreting process to actually fill out the form, but it'll all be available. So nobody will be left out. Um, you know, we're forming partners with people. I'm here today because I want to form a partnership with the city of Rancho Mirage. But it's simple. Uh, give us a, a link on your website that says who the Census Bureau is about, and we can <coughs> su supply that link. Uh, there's any number of ways. Just allowing us to come here today, uh, we really initiate that partnership. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you Doug, giving us how, the time. How do you get the word out nas nationally on television, newspapers? I don't think people realize how important it is and what the benefits are to this and to overfear the fear factor of people filling this out. Well, you know what? We use uh, social media, so we're currently using Facebook and LinkedIn. And I think on LinkedIn, you can go there any day of the week and see Census Bureau information. They're putting out some wonderful information and specifically little short video clips from people that we recognize that are in music or theater or movies or politicians that are saying, hey, let's all stand and be counted. So really, really important. But we're going to use the news. We're going to be talking to every newspaper we can talk with, every, t every TV station we can talk with, and we're going to do our best to get out the word and get this complete count or as complete as it can be 
for every community that we work in. And, uh, as a partnership specialist, uh, and both Dustin and I, and we work with another person that's our media specialist, and they really help get out the media information. Uh, so we're, we're doing everything we can to get the information out to where people can understand. It's easy, it's 10 questions, it's safe, your information is totally protected, so uh, that's really it. Yeah, and the benefit from that, I don't think people realize that the representation is so important in government from this census. I, I, I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to that I've said, you know, you're worth, yeah. beyond your net value, whatever you got in the bank, you're worth about 2,000 bucks more just to your community. Yeah, And amazing. people are astounded by that. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So concerning partnerships again, uh, that can be as easy as putting a link on your website. If you would so desire to form what they call a complete count committee, you could uh, ask for volunteers or identify somebody in the city organization that's a real doer. This is just an example of what a complete count committee could look like, but it doesn't have to look like that. But you could really try to get some people to form a committee and make sure that you're reaching out as far as you can reach within the community to make sure we get that complete count. And so if you want to do that, we have the tools and we have the training to help you do that, if you so choose to do that here at the city. Uh, a couple of just uh, real quick dates that we'll go through. And of course, the one that I, I mentioned earlier on is that you know really in uh, January, we'll start counting uh, in Alaska. March, we'll start counting here. April 1st is actually what we call the official census day. And then the apportionment counts go to the president on December 31st. And of course, it'll uh, go on the federal funding and how the funds are going to be allocated will come along uh, uh, sometime after that. Uh, our office, our regional office, is the Los Angeles regional office. It covers uh, these states here in the uh, western United States. And uh, so myself and Dustin, we're, we're really one of about 500 people that are out doing this covering the western United States. And uh, so we're just out spreading the goodwill and the word of, uh, of the Census Bureau. So we're also hiring. Another thing that you could put on your website if you so chose is our link to uh, that we're hiring. Because we're, uh, another fun fact is when we start hiring for the decennial census, we'll be the largest boots on the ground organization next to our US military. So we hire thousands and thousands of people. And then finally, if uh, you need any of my information, it's on the presentation and I know I emailed the presentation previously, so you all have access to that any time. And if you have um, any other questions, uh, Madam Mayor or Council, I'd be happy to take those. Okay, any other questions on this side? Pretty good. Any questions here? Do you uh, pay for volunteers? Well, uh, volunteers we wouldn't pay for, but we pay people to go do the count. So if people want to volunteer, that's not something I'm real familiar with. But all of our, what we call enumerators that are going to go out and say engage the homeless or other hard to count. Because if we don't get a response from your address, and we know every address in the country, so if we don't get that response uh, either by phone or by paper form or on the internet, then we're going to send enumerators out and start knocking on doors. And we're just trying to get to people to say, hey, this is what it is. Be counted. Simple. It's safe. Help us out, give us a count. And so uh, we are paying people, and those jobs, believe it or not, uh, they'll start at about $18 an hour. So they're not huge high paying jobs, but they're good jobs for people that want to go out yeah. and spend a couple of months working. Maybe they, you know, they just want to supplement their full time job or they just want to do something part time and be done with it. So it's boots on the ground and knocking on doors. That's it. That's when, it. when we don't get an answer from you online or by phone, it's, it's the army of the census that's going to come out and knock on your door. <laughs> so if right. no further questions, no I... Further questions? Well, we are absolutely delighted that you came here today. It's been a tremendous education for all of us. And needless to say, we're getting the word out because this city council meeting is uh, on our Rancho Mirage television four times daily, nine, Great. three, nine, and three. In fact, it's a really good nightlight. So anytime people tune into us, they'll be able to see you. They'll be able to learn everything that you're doing. And we are so pleased that we wanted to present you with a proclamation supporting uh, participation in the 2020 uh, census. And uh, for all those people that need to know a little bit about what this says, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, it starts off with, whereas an accurate census count is vital to our community and residents' well-being by helping planners determine where to locate schools, 
daycare centers, roads and public transportation, hospitals and other facilities, and is used to make decisions concerning business growth and housing needs, and whereas more than $675 billion per year in federal and state funding is allocated to the states and communities based on census data, and whereas the 2020 census creates jobs that stimulate economic growth and increase employment opportunities in our community. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Iris Smotridge, Mayor of the City of Rancho Mirage, California, and on behalf of the entire City Council, support participation in the United States 2020 Census. And we thank you so much, and we hope you will take this with our great appreciation. Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate thank you. that. Thank you thank so much. You. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you both for coming. Thank you too. Okay, well, that was really interesting, needless to say. Yeah. So we'll now move on to the non-agenda public comments. And this is an opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. And uh, we have three people who have filled out our yellow sheets. If you have not had a chance to fill out a yellow sheet and wish to speak after these people finish, you are more than welcome to come up to the podium. So we'll start out with Jim Elliott. And uh, Jim Elliott, yes. welcome. And uh, when you come up to the podium, please tell us where you reside. I will. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council and staff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I'm Jim Elliott. I live at 72447 Magnesia Falls, which is the last house on the right side just before Joshua. Uh, I'd like to address the in and out, the controversial in and out uh, location and something I prepared here. So I have a question for the Council. Uh, are you considering a second drive through restaurant for the Las Palmas Shopping Center? And before you answer, I'll read to you the comments by the city attorney on page 2-67 of the proposed development agreement. And I quote, typically the city's development agreements have a 10 to 30 year term. 15 years is the minimum the staff recommends. The, uh, the concern is that a one year term, that the city has a, with a, with a, with a one year term, the city has a fairly narrow window to decide whether to require future changes to the on-site traffic circulation for vehicular pedestrian <coughs> safety reasons reasons. <clears throat> in addition, this is the primary consideration the city will receive in exchange for allowing an additional drive through fast food restaurant at the Rancho Las Palmas Center. It's clear to me that a second drive through fast food restaurant is being discussed and considered. Moving on, the city attorney submitted a supplemental staff report to the Planning Commission regarding the necessity of a development agreement on September 12th as a result of the Planning Commission hearing on September 11th. This is very interesting reading on page two of Mr. Quintanilla's, uh, my pardon if I say it wrong, uh, page 241 of the documents on the city, city website, it states that under the development agreement recommended by the city attorney and not yet agreed to by in and out the following, and this is in reference to the project's discretionary entitlements. And I quote, the project site shall not permit ingress or egress from the current access point on the north side of the subject parcel. As such, developers shall reconfigure the internal traffic circulation of the project site to eliminate the northerly access point adjacent to the current drive-through entry of the subject parcel by extending the existing landscape planter across the access point to eliminate vehicular and pedestrian ingress or egress. This condition shall be fulfilled prior to the issuance of a building permit for the main in and out building. This refers to the Magnesia Falls entrance to and from Las Palmas. This is de facto admission that traffic is a problem and further evidence that the traffic study done was incomplete and flawed in my opinion. <clears throat> there is a silver lining as a result of the controversy and the impact of this proposed project. It has and is bringing our affected neighborhood together as a political force. There are 73 homes in, on Rancho, Desert and Barba, 23 on Joshua and Magnesia, another 52 in White Sun Estates in addition to several hundred in Magnesia Cove. I spoke at the uh, RMCA meeting last night, which was well attended. The opposition to this project was virtually unanimous with 40 attendees signing a petition opposing the project, which I have filed with the city. This is in addition to the 60 that have signed so, uh, online so far. There will be more. Basically, the project notification went to so few homes 
uh, we are playing catch up. As you know, notification was sent to only a handful of homes in compliance with the municipal code, but certainly not in compliance with the, the spirit of it. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker will be Joy Lynn Henry. Excuse me, this is my first time public speaking, so I'm extremely nervous. Pull the microphone a little closer to you. Okay. We'll hear your first time. Perfect. <laughs> Hello, my name is Joy Lynn Henry. My husband and I live at 43197 Joshua Road in Rancho Mirage. I was shocked to hear your plans to approve a fast food drive through restaurant. This will significantly affect the value of my beautiful home. The reason being that everyone already cuts through our neighborhood, but with a fast food restaurant at the end of our street, it will literally create thousand times worse. The past pre president of the Realtors Board has said that it turns Joshua Road and Magnesia Falls into a main artery as shown on Google Maps as the quickest way to the shopping center from Monterey Avenue, which again will affect the value of all of our homes in the area. Palm Springs has a huge homeless problem, but guess what? You guys are about to help them as homeless love to panhandle at drive through restaurants as well as 111 between Bob Hope Drive and Palm View, Park View, excuse me, is one of the busiest in the valley, as also great for panhandling. They are already sleeping behind Goodwill and underneath the bridge. But you are about to provide a great source of food, income, and alcohol through CVS for them. In and Out says it plans to build a wall with bushes around it, so you now have made them a new home. They have the wash to throw out all their trash, and I wonder what the impact of that will be. I have many ideas of how to help the homeless, but that's for another day. We know, as we know, this will now become known as, instead of restaurant row, we're going to become fast food row. If this is approved, McDonald's, Wendy's, KFC, etc., will now all also want a piece of the pie. You're, you're setting the groundwork for this to happen. What happened that Rancho Mirage was always a city that was not a for drive through restaurants? I don't understand that. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your comments. <laughs> Our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Galberto Melendez. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, City Council. Good afternoon. Can you please state where you reside? I, I reside in this area. I can't give you my address for security reasons. Okay. City council, um, our staff, employees, contractors, and we, the Pueblo. As usual, I'm happy to see you, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank the Brown Act. I'm happy to see you all, and as usual, um, I'm talking about what I always talk about, <clears throat> about, and that is the College of the Desert, and that is our sister city, Palm Desert, and that is, of course, that we don't lose population, so the that our census numbers will be high enough that we get all our um, benefits from the federal government. Think of it this way. We that live in the Coachella Valley, and I understand that there's about 19 high schools, that there is 19 high schools 
in the Coachella Valley and think that these students that want to uh, <clears throat> attend, attend a, a college um, can, only, can only look forward to attend college in their homegrown college, which is the co College <clears throat> of the Desert, uh, for two years. And then they have to leave and start a new life unless they want to go to one of the branches of the, of the other universities that uh, have branches in this, in this area. So again, and I'm going to keep repeating it over and over and over, at infinitum, that the College of the Desert uh, needs to have offer a four-year degree, a bachelor's degree. I see very bright students, tough and bright and smart, that have already been brainwashed, that, 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 that all they can get is an associate's degree from their college, the college of the desert. We are the desert. So that, 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 that's an unfairness in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now we will move on to the City Council uh, member comments. And do we have anyone on this side that would like to speak? Ted, Richard? Yes, Mayor. All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And I welcome you all here today. And I bet you did not know that September is officially Library Card Sign-Up Month. I did. You, oh, okay, well, I won't go any further then. Okay. <laughs> The Rancho Mirage Library and the Observatory is celebrating this occasion by releasing six new library card designs. Did you know that? I did. Oh, okay. <coughs> Included in these designs are two winning submissions from the Children's Library Card Design Contest. One is Caitlin Honor, and the other one is Daphne Lee. With the release of these new designs, the library will also be simplifying their library card system, allowing you to carry just one card. Did you know that? I did. <laughs> just one card that will give access to all the library services and programs. Gone are those days of having to carry both the library card and the gold card. Do you remember those days? Absolutely. Now, all you need is one library card, and that will act as both. In addition to the new library card system, the library has also released their new programs and exhibits bro brochure, which features all of the wonderful program that you have to offer during the months of January, I'm sorry, not January, September, October, and November. As the library and observatory continues to evolve, there continues to explore how they can most effectively serve our patrons. So head on down to the Rancho Mirage Library and observatory today, Ted, today. Oh, I will. And get your new library card and pick up your program guide where the possibilities of lifelong learning are endless. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you so much. Richard, I think you and Ted should take that show on the road. Listen, we were just trying it out to good. see how everybody good. liked it. This is kind of a dress rehearsal. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Doors are open. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ted, did you have comments? I did. Thank you, uh, Iris. Uh, the city takes great pride in maintaining all of our amenities in a truly first-class manner. As a result of the introduction of Broadway-type productions, we have found another format the audiences will enjoy. Consequently, we have introduced with much success the opportunity to provide entertainment along with seating for the serving of dinner, much like a supper club, only under the stars. This picture shows the removing of grass and being replaced with pavers. This will allow for the easy movement of service and walking comfortably between the tables. It's really gonna be 
so attractive. The, the facility is attractive anyway. The sound booth has been relocated to a lower terrace to enhance the volume monitoring and control functions. This simple but effective improvement will allow the soundboard operators to set volume levels throughout the amphitheater in a much more consistent manner. This picture reflects a concrete pad for vendors to set up their display and staging areas. It gives the vendors a solid workspace and makes the cleanup a breeze. One of the major successes, success stories is the dog park. I stop by periodically to chat with the folks using the facility, and I'm always amazed at how far some drive to use this wonderful amenity. Last weekend, when I was there, I met two families from Yucca Valley, one from Beaumont and another from Redlands. I assumed they were visiting friends or family, but they had specifically come to use the dog park. This facility is much like a coffee shop, and people enjoy the social experience and have made many friends. This picture re reflects the removal of concrete surrounding shading post on the large dog side and will re be replaced with large rocks that will be more attractive and practical in preventing marking and overall maintenance. This slide reflects, supposed to be, uh, yeah, that's the one previously that's being, that's being replaced. The next slide reflects the, the damaged grass area, if you'd go to that one. Uh, all damaged areas will be resawed and ready for the November opening. This is just an example of the length to which the city goes to maintain the amenities, to enhance the experience. Whether it be the amphitheater, the dog park, the library, or the observatory, the 9227 zip code connotates a level of excellence, and it's our objective to maintain that level of excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. All right, moving on to this side. Charlie, do you have any comments? I, ha I think I've spoken enough today. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. All right, Dana? Thank you. No. Okay. All right, so now we will go on to our city manager comments. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we finished our hearing loop project in this room. And so uh, anyone that activates their T-coil on their hearing aid device uh, will be automatically hooked up to the hearing loop system that's been installed in this chamber and also every room over in the library where we host meetings and lectures and functions. Thank you, Isaiah. All right. So now we will move on to the minutes. And if there are no additions or corrections, may I have a motion and a you second? You have it. Okay, second. Charlie's making a motion, and Ted is a second. Uh, please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Johnny. Okay, now we'll move on to our consent calendar, and that will be. Uh, handled by our city manager, Isaiah. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the city council. You have set of seven items on the consent calendar for your consideration. Item number one is to waive the full reading of all ordinances introduced or adopted pursuant to this agenda. Item number two is the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 1154, Levying special taxes within the city of Rancho Mirage Community Facilities District number 4B, and that is for the Dell Webb project. Item number three is the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 1155, amending section 9.58.010, definitions of chapter 9.58, mobile home rent control of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code to clarify that maximum rent increases are based upon the consumer price index of the Riverside, San Bernardino, Ontario area. Item number four is a one-year extension of track map 36809-1. This is phase one of the Del Webb project. 
Item number five is uh, two awards to two qualified nonprofits that total $6,000 through our special assistance fund program. Item number six are contracts and item number seven are demands and staff is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, regarding nope. this consent calendar? Move adoption of the consent calendar. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Johnny. And now we'll move on to item number eight, and that's on our action calendar. And this is something that's going to be handled by uh, Jeremy Gleim, uh, our Development Services uh, Director. And this is the subject matter is ordinance to regulate camping within the city. Thank you, Mayor. So items eight and nine go uh, together. The, uh, the first item for your consideration is the introduction of an ordinance which will um, basically add a section to the municipal code to regulate camping within the city. So the city's existing camping regulations are limited in scope and likely not enforceable due to recent actions taken at the federal level. And so this just is a way to be consistent with constitutional law and make sure we can enforce and have policies in place for enforcement. Um, the proposed ordinance also restricts storing of personal property upon streets, parks, and other public lands. So it basically just sets in motion some ground rules and regulations that we can then <clears throat> use to enforce um, the next item on your agenda for consideration, which is a policy to clean up encampments on public property. Um, so that's about it for the first one. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Any questions from council? On this side? Okay. No questions? All right, I'll open it up to the public for comments or questions. Seeing none, we'll close the public comments. And uh, may I have a motion? I will make the motion that the city council introduce ordinance number next in order. Adding chapter 8.63 camping regulations to the Title VIII Health and Safety, amending section 8.26020 use restrictions of Chapter 8.26, City Park and Recreation Facility Regulations, and amending section 9.30.200 camping of Chapter 9.30 use of library and observatory of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. <clears throat> that motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Johnny. All right, now we'll move on to item number nine, and that's also going to be handled by Jeremy. <clears throat> and this is related to uh, standard operating procedure for the removal of homeless encampments on the public right-of-way and city-owned property. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So this item is for the adoption of a resolution which will adopt a policy to um, adequately enforce the removal of camps. So if a camp is identified, it's basically a procedural document. So it lists regulations and a process whereby staff could investigate and seize and then store property again, consistent with state and federal laws. Um, and having a policy in place, um, again, just helps with enforcement. So that's about it for, for this item. Again, it's just so uh, we can adopt a resolution to get a policy in place for cleanup. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from Council? I do. You're, why don't you just tell them how long we have to hold? Sure, so based on regulations, both from the state and federal governments, um, number one, we have to provide a 24-hour notice before we can clean up any personal property on public lands. And any property that we seize or confiscate has to be stored for a minimum of 90 days. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, you know, another area um, that, uh, that gets very delicate is when there is camping <clears throat> and you want to get a... Um, the right to inspect 
the the camp the the tent and so forth. Uh, you need a search warrant for that, but you don't need a search warrant if it's, for example, temporary, like a cardboard facility. So it gets very tricky from a pure legal enforcement standpoint, and the law is very much, you know, on the side of the homeless. So uh, municipalities have a great deal of exposure if it's not handled properly, obviously. Thank you. Richard? Jeremy, is the enforcement done by the city uh, or is it done by the, the sheriff's department or how is it handled? Sure. So when we go to investigate um, an encampment, uh, it'll start with city staff with code compliance. And if they need to um, ask for help from the sheriff's department, then they have the ability to do so. But it'll start with city staff. Okay. Thank you. Let me add something that kind of clarify some other issues related to this. Basically, the Supreme Court ruled that we can't criminalize homelessness. So um, we're taking an administrative approach to it. So it's like that's why staff would go out there and um, you know, try to get them to remove them. But we're not going to arrest the homeless or issue misdemeanor citations or infractions. Have we previously had any enforcement in our city? Well, I can answer that in my store. I've had it twice where the procedure was followed through from staff and did it excellent. Okay. What do they do now? Well, thank God I sold the store. <laughs> <laughs> so Ethan Allen has remodeled it all, and I think that will go away. The problem that I had was the building was vacant for almost two years, so I had to have security people that checked it twice a day and all that. Even with that... There is an issue, but I will say that our staff really jumps in and takes great pride in handling it in a very nice, diplomatic, and respectful way. Yeah, and, you know, obviously from a city standpoint, that's why we budget $160,000 a year uh, to support programs that support the homeless. Um, because at the end of the day, being homeless is not illegal. And that's the purpose of this pr procedure is there is a uh, respect and uh, process that is required by both state and federal law. And so when staff takes action, that's why this policy is laid out the way it is. It provides that roadmap. Yeah. Thank you. Any further comments? Well, I just will say that uh, as a, a property owner on 111 with a, a business building, uh, or anything, it's a wonderful thing to know that picking up that phone and uh, calling City Hall starts a wonderful reaction of helping you as an owner of the property, also helping these people who are homeless and giving them the direction of where they can go to find places that are there to help them, house them, and take care of them. Thank you, Charlie. Sure. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public comments and move to a motion. I'll make a motion um, that the City Council adopt resolution number 2019, next in order, adopting a policy for the abatement of unlawful camps and storage of personal property on public lands. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Johnny. All right, we'll now move on to item number 10, and this is uh, going to be handled by Kofi Antebaum. He is the Director of Administrative Services, and the subject is the lump sum payment of CalPERS pension liability. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> thank you, Council. Um, before proceeding to my presentation, my PowerPoint presentation, I would like to Thank um, the fiscal year 1920 budget subcommittee, which consists of um, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and um, Councilman Kai. The subcommittee and staff met and performed an in-depth review of um, this item before concluding that presenting an option for a lump sum payment of the current CalPES um, pension liability of approximately 893,000 to the council for consideration was the best option. 
And so I'll briefly go through um, a six slide presentation to talk about the numbers that we are looking at. All right, so in November of 2017, um, the city council approved a lump sum payment um, to pay off the pension liability that the city had at the time. And so with that payment, the pension liability um, or the pension plan went from being 90.2% um, funded to 100% funded status. As of the June 30, 2018 valuation report, which was re received this year, the city's um, pension plan is 98.8% funded. And just to put this in context, um, out of 1,457 miscellaneous um, pension plans statewide, 35 of the plans are at least 98% um, funded. Overall, the funding ratio for these plans, for the miscellaneous plan, it's 71.7%, and for the safety plan, it's 68.5% um, statewide. And so that, that, that shows you that the city is really um, taking um, a forefront in, in, in making sure that our pension liability, it's, it's been funded. Now, the primary reason for the drop or the decrease of 1.2% in our funded status was mainly due to changes in assumptions and method by the plan, the CALPAS um, pension plan. As was presented in 2017 um, during the um, approval of the lump sum payment, on December 21st, 2016, the CalPERS board voted to lower the discount rate from 7.5% to 7% um, over a three-year period. So starting in fiscal year 17-18, the discount rate was being reduced gradually. And so um, the 1.2% drop in our current funded status is mainly because the last valuation um, the assumption or the um, discount rate was 7.25, and that has now dropped down to 7%. And so that's what is causing this drop in our funded status. So um, based on the most recent CalPES reports that we received, the city's three pension plans is projected to have an a total unfunded liability as of June 30, 2020, of 941,000, approximately 941,000. And so what staff did was that um, we requested a payoff quote from CalPERS. And so if we are to pay off this balance as of tomorrow, September 20th, we'll be paying approximately 893,000, saving the city 48,000 in, in, in doing that. That is one option we have to make a lump sum payment. The other option is if we don't make a lump sum payment, we'll be subject to CalPERS repayment plan, which will be paying off this unfunded liability of approximately 941,000 over a 20 year period. And in doing that, we'll end up paying 1.7, um, approximately 1.74 million over the 20 year period. And the main reason for this is the way the CalPERS um, pension plan works is that for the liability of 941,000 that we have, that money should be something that we are paying to CalPERS. And so by not having that money and earning a 7% um, interest on it, that 7% interest is charged back to the city. And so that's, um, if we don't do anything about this amount in terms of paying it off now and follow the 20 year um, payment plan, repayment plan from CalPERS will end up paying approximately 800,000 in interest. And so um, when the subcommittee and staff met, um, it's the recommendation from the subcommittee that um, council um, consider approval of a lump sum payment. And so if this payment is approved, this um, um, table here is just showing how it, the payment is going to be allocated. Within the city, there are three funds that pay for employees, the general fund, the library fund, and then the housing authority. So this schedule is just showing if this lump sum payment is approved by council, how that is going to be allocated among those funds. 
Um, the next slide I have here is just showing what this, the impact of this payment is going to have on the general fund reserves. And so um, it's projected that our um, fund balance as of June 30, 2019 is going to be 68.5 million approximately. And so by um, paying this lump sum payment, um, even after the payment, we'll end up having about 67.6 million in reserves. And so to conclude my presentation, I would just like to state that by utilizing the city's reserves to pay down the remaining unfunded pension liability, the pension plan's funded status will increase from the current 98.8% to 100% funded. And although we cannot guarantee that the pension plan will, be, will always stay 100% funded because it will be subject to future gains and losses and actuarial assumptions, um, by paying off the pension liability and bringing the plan to 100% funded status will greatly increase the city's long-term sustainability of the plan. And that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Kofi. And now our, uh, our city manager uh, will explain just a little bit about uh, what a discount rate means. Sure. Uh, so... The cities uh, took a very early proactive approach to uh, the pension issue, and it's something that was uh, recognized by the council, and uh, the council took very early action on this. Uh, you really can't go to a, uh, a government seminar or training anymore without hearing about the pension crisis that is getting ready to crush people. So in December of 2014, uh, the city council approved a lump sum payment to go 100% funded. And when you look back at the uh, newspaper articles from that time, I mean, really from other agencies, we were laughed at and we were blasted. Uh, people saying, How, look at Rancher Mirage, that's so ridiculous. Why would you pay that off? It's like a mortgage, you pay it over time, it's not that big of a deal. You know, they could be overfunded. We heard it all. Uh, no one's singing that tune anymore. Uh, so, of course, we all know what has happened now is uh, CalPERS changed the discount rate. Well, what is uh, the discount rate? The discount rate is their assumed rate of return. So a pension plan has assets. <clears throat> they invest those assets, and they need to return interest on their investments. Explain just a little bit how the assumptions go into making that Sure. So when a pension plan says we're going to earn 7.5% on our money, that's net after cost. So that's what they call the discount rate. And so the plan is funded with three sets of money. Uh, return on investment. The employees contribute a portion of their own money into the plan. That's fixed. The employer contributes into the plan. So when you lower the amount of money that is projected to come from investments, so when CalPERS said, hey, we're not going to earn 7.5% on this plan, we're only going to earn 7%, there's less money that's coming into that plan in our assumptions because now they're projecting into the future saying instead of 7.5% return every year, we're only going to earn 7 Well, the employee portion's fixed. So that only leaves the employer to make up the backfall. These plans all have very large balances. So there's a volatility ratio that is described within our plans that says, compared to payroll, there's 10 to 12 times the amount of assets in the plan. So when you think of it as a percentage of payroll, a 1% impact on the plan is really 10 to 12% of your payroll. So because of the balance in these plans, when you change the assumption that half a percent, and that's compounded for 20 years, these are very significant impacts to employers. Because again, you're reducing the amount of money that's supposed to go to the plan from investments. The employee contribution's fixed, which only leaves the employer to make up that difference. And so by doing this, uh, CalPERS recognized when uh, they needed to make this change that if they made it immediately, 
uh, they would instantly crush government at a very fragile time. Um, during the recession, uh, you know, from a revenue standpoint, yeah, you can say we, we are out of it, but there are a lot of governments where their expenses have outpaced the growth in revenue. So even though we're not in a recession and, uh, you know, from a revenue standpoint, things look good, our costs have actually increased faster than our revenues. So a lot of governments are still teetering, even though our revenues are really strong, they're still teetering on uh, even providing services. So what CalPERS did is they kicked the can down the road. And they said, we recognize that we need to make this change right now, but if we did that, that would crush most employers. So they phased this in. And essentially what is happening for the typical agency is the amount that you have to contribute to the unfunded portion over this five-year period is doubling and sometimes tripling for agencies. And the other thing that CalPERS did is they broke it away from a percentage of payroll. And so that's a pretty significant change. Now what they're doing is they're just sending you an invoice saying this is what you owe. Well, in the last recession, how we got out from some of our problems was we started to man manipulate payroll. We cut positions. We lowered salaries. Well, now when you disconnect the unfunded pension uh, liability payment from a percentage of payroll, you can reduce salaries all you want, and that doesn't change the uh, invoice amount that you're going to get from CalPERS. So in these changes in November of 17, so in December of 14, we went fully funded, and we put in the staff report, hey, we're going to have to make another payment because of all these assumptions that are being changed by CalPERS. November of 17, uh, we made another payment, went back up to 100% funded, knowing that there was one more drop. Now, the reason that this amount um, is, in the scope of things, uh, rather minor, so we're talking about $850,000, we're not talking about millions and millions, is because of the proactive approach that we took early on. We got our money in the plan. Uh, we had, obviously, CalPERS had some good years. They had some low years, but they count on that. At the end of the day, if... We don't pay this off. CalPERS is going to charge us 7%. So it's like carrying debt at 7%. And they're going to amortize this into our rates over a 20-year period. So we're going to be carrying 900000 in debt over a 20-year period at 7% interest, which is why if we pay this off right now, you know, we're going to make an $850,000 payment approximately, and we're going to save 800000 in interest over that 20-year period. And the pension plan is going to have a hard enough time just keeping up with the discount rate assumption. So even though they say, hey, we're going to earn 7% on our money, that's the discount rate, they fully know that over the next decade is the most critical time for the CalPERS plans. And so it's not like they're going to end perfectly at 7% every year. You know, they understand some years are going to be a little less, some years are a little bit more, that 7% is really an average over a longer period of time. And so if your money's not in the plan, you don't give your plan the ability to take advantage of those up years to build the cushion for when their returns are a little below the discount rate. So by fully funding your plan, uh, you give it the best opportunity to ride the highs and build that cushion for the years where they don't meet the discount rate. At the end of the day, to assume that return on investment is going to be so strong that it's going to meet the 7% over that long period of time, plus make up for this assumption change is just not a realistic expectation. And so that's what we're saying here is return on investment is going to have a hard enough time just meeting the 7% assumption over this period of time. No one's thinking that the return on investment is going to be so strong that it makes up for the assumption change, so that drop in the discount rate. And so that's why we're back here again to say we've got reserves. This is why we have them. Let's not carry debt at 7%. Let's pay this thing off right now and give our pension plan the best chance of being successful. Thank you so much. What an education. Uh, and for all those at home who are watching this, um, it, if you ever want something explained financially, uh, Isaiah is the man to do it. See Kofi. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, between Kofi and uh, Isaiah, uh, we've got a, a winning team and we, we treasure them both. Thank you. Any questions from this side? Oh, okay. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Uh, very well done. And uh, do we have any comments from uh, the uh, public? Okay, we have somebody coming up. Yes, from staff, and this is our Marcus Salomon. Mark Salomon, city staff. Good afternoon, Mayor Smotrich, city council. I'm here today as the Rancho Mirage Employee Association chair, and on behalf of our membership, I wanna thank you for your proactive approach in keeping the CalPERS pension plan fully funded. Excuse me. <laughs> um, your continued support and investment to the futures of our members is greatly appreciated, and I just want to make sure to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, we're always thrilled to hear good comments. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, a motion. And I'm sorry. Okay, Ted. The the fact that we have the ability to make this payment is quite remarkable. Yeah. When you consider the number of cities, and, and Kofi quoted that the average unfunded pension liability <clears throat> is approximately, well, it, it, it's funded to the extent of 68%. So give or take, there's 30% unfunded pension liability on average throughout California. I think it's quite remarkable. I think we're one of the unique cities, not only in California, but probably in the country, that has no unfunded pension liability, no bonded indebtedness, uh, and a reserve, according to this at the present time, of approximately $67 million. Uh, that doesn't come easily. It comes with good, strong financial planning. And the fact that we're taking this proactive approach is critical. As Isaiah points out, it's very ambitious for CalPERS to project a 7% return. I don't think there's anyone here or in the audience that's watching that wouldn't say, how can I sign up for a guaranteed 7% return on my money? It's not available, unless, of course, obviously, there's much higher risk. So again, uh, I say that we're fortunate the, the city that represents the 92270 zip code is quite, um, quite fortunate to be in this strong financial position. And we are saving ourselves $800,000 in interest over a 20 year period. And as Mark has pointed out, what we have done is we've assured all of our employees that their pension will be safe when they retire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I say I just had one question for you. And, and of course, um, Dana and I have worked with you on this retirement program. Uh, even though we bring our balance up today to zero, uh, next year we'll be back again looking at what the earned amount has been and trying to determine whether, in fact, we have to make a payment or we don't have to make a payment. So this is a process that we go through every year and unable to make that decision today because we don't know what kind of rate of return uh, they'll get next year. Yeah, definitely. So it's something that uh, we get a new actuar actuarial report from CalPERS every year. So it's something that we monitor uh, every year. And, you know, when you're projecting uh, what we're going to be re required to pay for an employee that's working today and still has another 20 years of service before they can retire, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this number. So what are we going to earn? The discount rate, the mortality rate, what is that person's salary estimated to be when they retire? Uh, so there's many things that go into that. So when this is updated every year, it's something that we keep our uh, pulse on and continue to monitor. Okay, thank you for your questions and comments. I will move that the City Council authorize the City Manager to execute a $892,867 payment to CalPERS to bring the City's pension plans to 100% funded. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote.
Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Johnny. And now that brings us to the end of our agenda. We thank you all for being here, and we are now in adjournment and look forward to seeing you next time. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh pardon me. Wait, so wait. We're going to go into closed session. Yes, and the Steve, city has, Steve will give us an update on that. The City Council is now going to recess <laughs> in a closed session to confer with legal counsel regarding three potential initiation of litigation items that's pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D4. The Council will also confer with legal counsel regarding the exist, existing litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D1. Um, the case name is unspecified in the agenda because disclosure of the case name will jeopardize existing settlement negotiations. Thank you so much, Steve. And now we will be in adjournment. See you next time.